Välkommen till Miljöveckan i Gunnarsbyn. Det är fjortonde gången vi har Miljövecka i Gunnarsbyn. Och som brukligt brukar vi ha olika föreläsningar. Veckans föreläsningar är digitala med en liten publik på plats här. Och kvällens föreläsning kommer att vara på engelska. So welcome to the environmental week in Gunnarsbyn. It's the 14th time we are having an environmental week. And normally different lectures are being given. This is uh, going to be so this week as well, but they will be online. The first lecture, it's about uh, hunting, jakten, och jaktens betydelse för den biologiska mångfalden. Uh, och föreläsning kommer att just på engelska. So, welcome, Lea. Wanamba Ness. Please. Okay, so good evening everyone and I would like to take this opportunity first to thank uh, the team here that invited me to speak on this topic which I really is a, I'm a I'm passionate about uh, environment in general. And a topic which I am not too comfortable with is of course hunting. So I took this as a challenge and I hope that I'll be able to deliver on some of the, uh, on the intended purpose. So my presentation is on hunting and biodiversity. And I'll start with kind of defining what biological diversity is. So biological, diver biological diversity is also known as biodiversity in short, and it's about a variety in plants, animals, and microorganisms. So the variety in the species, it also includes the genetic differences between, within the species themselves. What is good about biodiversity? Biodiversity provides a large number of goods and ecosystem services that sustain our lives. We get food from nature, We get pollination from the bees, which are important now. We know without the bees, there will be no pollination and not, thus no food from agriculture. We get medicines from the plants and animals that are out in nature. They regulate climate when you have forests that controls climate through mitigation of carbon dioxide and also the, uh, they control the rainfall patterns. We also have shelter, which is provided by nature, both for humans and wildlife. We have resources which go to governments in terms of ecotourism. Countries like Kenya, where I come from, depend heavily on ecotourism-based, um, eco-based tourism. Um, so thus it contributes to national budgets. Nature also and biodiversity contributes to human and mental health. Um, there is a growing field now on ecotherapy where people are encouraged to go out to nature and it's supposed to be bringing good um, well-being to, to people. Uh, those who were locked up during the COVID-19 period know how important it was to be closer to nature as opposed to being locked up in a city with, without access to some of these biological services. Um, currently, uh, but the loss of nature has been listed as one of the three plan planetary crises. The first one, of course, is climate change. But now we are realizing more and more that we are losing nature and focus is now shifting to protection of biodiversity. Um, there's um, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem-Based Services, in short, IPBES. It's a body which uh, does research on biodiversity. They did a global assessment report on biodiversity and ecosystem services in 2019. And the assessment gave Um, actually produced an alarming figure. They said that around one animal, plant and animal species are now threatened with extinction more than ever before in history. And most of the species which are threatened with extinction, they are looking at within decades, not centuries again. So we are losing species at a faster rate now. And the drivers, the main drivers to this loss include climate change, which is listed as the third one, Changes in the land use and sea, when you convert land which was previously forest, for example, and turn it to agriculture, 
or just clearing of land. Um, direct exploitation, this is where the hunting comes in, um, of organisms. We have pollution and also the issue of invasive species. Of relevance to this topic, of course, is the direct exploitation of organisms. There exist governance structures in place to control this. This exists at the global level, at the regional level, national, and also the local level. At the international level, we have the Convention on Biological Diversity, and um, it ex establishes three main goals, the con conservation of biological diversity, the sustainable use of its components. I'm going to reemphasize the sustainable use, because uh, this is where it comes back to the hunting and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits from the use of genetic resources. We also have the EU Biodiversity Strategy for 2030. And under the EU's bio Biodiversity Strategy, it's a, it's a comprehensive, ambitious, and long-term plan to protect nature and reverse the degradation of ecosystems. The strategy aims to put Europe's biodiversity on a path to recovery by 2030, and it contains very many actions and commitments. If you go to the website, this strategy is available in all the EU languages, including Swedish. And um, at the global level, we have other mechanisms which are also aimed at um, protecting biodiversity. We all know of the Sustainable Development Goals. These are a set of about 17 goals which the countries came together and signed up as the goals that would need to get both the environment and people to a better place than we are. So the target is to get, the target is to have this achievement by 2030. And I'm going to highlight the specific one which is related to the topic today, and that is the Sustainable Development Goal number 15. This one, I'll read it out, is to protect, restore, promote the sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage forests, combat desertification, and halt reverse land degradation and halt biodiversity loss. So this one contains the management of uh, terrestrial, which is land ecosystems, and is also talking about stopping the loss of biodiversity. At the regional level, I'm going to mention Africa as well. We have what we call the Africa Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. And it has a goal as well on environmentally sustainable climate and resilient economies and communities. And under it, we have putting in place measures to sustainably manage the continent's rich biodiversity, forests, land, and water, using adaptive measures to address climate change risk, etc. So we see all these frameworks have the word sustainability in them. And it comes now to the hunting bit of it, which is on my next uh, slide. So what about hunting? So hunting can be good when it's about conservation. There are many reasons when, where uh, communities or governments go for a hunting. When it's done for conservation, its permits are issued and re the resources which are re got from the permits are plowed back into research to conserving the wildlife. For, for example, if it's wildlife, um, it's also used to fund conservation efforts uh, at the country level. Hunting is also for food and subsistence. We have communities which are forest communities that depend on hunting for food, for basic needs. And that kind of hunting, of course, is more at a family level. Um, and we also have hunting for sport, which is uh, depending on the continent where you're from. For some countries, it's for sport. For others, it's mainly on the food side of it. Um, Hunting is also for a source of income. Some communities will hunt, but not for food. They will hunt to sell. So it comes, the issue of trade kicks in here. Um, sometimes hunting is done to control wildlife populations, um, and this is mainly to reduce the human-wildlife conflict. When you have too many of a particular species, uh, due to the limited space, we have encroached on um, wildlife areas due to growing populations, urbanization, we have construction going on. So when we encroach into these spaces, of course, we push the wildlife away and they sometimes can push back and start moving and encroaching in land. So there is, to control the populations, of course, the decision is usually to control the wildlife population and not the human population there. So the hunting could be 
as um, introduced to to reduce some of these impacts. But hunting can go wrong um, when it's unsustainable, when permits are issued and we hunt species which are maybe the wrong uh, age. If you find some animals don't grow to a certain age because they're all hunted, maybe the hunting permit is for males. So you find all the males of a certain species don't have grow to, to the age they're supposed to. Um, I think it affects also the production system uh, in the wildlife, in, the, in that particular species. There are some studies which have been done. I'm not good at those studies, but I'm sure our experts here would be able to tell us about how sometimes hunting can affect the type of species health and also the, the offspring of the, of the wildlife. Um, we have, I don't know about the scale on, in Europe, but we do have corruption in some cases where a permit is issued um, to some hunting groups and then they, over, they go beyond the quota allowed or they, they hunt a species which they are not supposed to. For example, if you are only supposed to shoot lions which are of a particular age, you can find, and in a particular zone, you may find someone has tricked the lion to move out of the zone where they're protected so they can be hunted out there. Uh, the issuing of permits also is affected. And then we also have the zoonotic diseases. Uh, we are in a pandemic right now, and we all know that zoonotic diseases are diseases that jump from, anim from animals to humans through, of course, an intermediary species in the middle there. So depending on the laws and regulation of a country, um, hunting could, if not well done, and if illegally done especially, uh, bring out issues of zoonotic diseases. Um, I think I will stop there on the hunting um, and then move to some of the key recommendations which I picked up from this. And um, mainly I'll focus going back to the fact that this is the biological diversity, the environment week and with a focus on biological diversity. Um, so I have recommendations here and at the international level, we have commitments Right now, there are ongoing discussions at the international level where we have over 100 countries negotiating um, a global framework for biodiversity, which will come into effect. It's supposed to have happened last year. So the framework is called the post-2020 biodiversity framework. Of course, the meeting did not happen last year. It's going hopefully to happen later this year, but the negotiations are ongoing. So hopefully that we hope that countries will commit to uh, a good framework that will contribute to the halting or stopping the loss of biodiversity and putting nature on the path of recovery for the benefit of people and the planet. Again, um, hunting is to benefit not just the people, it's also for the planet. So we need to find a balance there. And these kinds of frameworks also have the sustainable use of some of these resources. So there are guidelines and recommendations on how you can manage wildlife populations um, without necessarily driving them to extinction. Uh, at the international and national levels, there's also recommendations for the One Health approach. This is where you ensure that the animal health, the species health, and the wildlife health and environment health are balanced because we've realized the animal health, if it's not good, it affects the human health. And of course, if the environment health is not good, it affects the wildlife or the animal health, which in turn affects the human. So we'd need to have an approach where the three conventions or the three organizations like the WHO, the CITES, and also the human, the, yeah, the human, the World Health Organization, the wildlife organizations and environment ministries work together to find solutions which are balanced to ensure that we don't have more of these like zoonotic diseases, etc. Uh, at the regional and national levels, there are alternative methods to hunting, uh, to controlling wildlife populations and probably new uh, guidelines on how to carry out this hunting and also uh, the numbers considering this species loss that we are looking at right now. 
I've seen cases in countries where they are trying to reintroduce species which were hunted to extinction, e even if they were legally hunted, so with, com with proper permits. So it's not easy to reintroduce species back to nature. Um, so n care has to be taken at least from the national and regional level. Uh, by regional, I'm looking at if it's Africa, you look at the continental one, and if it's Europe at the EU level, I'm sure there are guidelines there which need to be down, um, broken down to the, to, the, to the local level, like the Gunash bin Kumin, for example. Um, another, day, another one is um, May is actually um, a month for biodiversity internationally. We have the International Day for Biological Diversity, which falls on 22nd of May of each year. This year, the theme is we are part of the solution. And so communities, schools, governments, they usually organize events and activities around these themes. Last year, the theme was on our solutions are in nature. And indeed, our solutions are in nature. We have learned that nature-based solutions could contribute to fighting other crises that we have, such as climate change. And um, so the hope is that this year's theme will build on the momentum from last year's um, theme where people are encouraged to go out and contribute and think about it. And maybe, maybe with that, we'll find better ways of living with our wildlife and wild spaces. And with that, um, Mr. Chair, I would like to end my presentation and welcome the audience for questions, including those who are following us on Facebook. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, I just have to mention to all those followers at home that uh, you as well have the possibility of asking questions. If you go to the chat function, uh, you can, you can uh, ask your questions there and we will uh, ask Leah them here. So please, you are here as well. Johnny. Um, in regard to the COVID pandemic, how much effect do you think that may have or impact on our efforts to increase and improve biodiversity? Has it put us back or, or hasn't it had much effect at all? So the question from John is... With, uh, with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, how much has, how has that contributed to conservation efforts? How is it impacting how, conservation efforts? How is it impacting the conservation efforts? Um, has it made it better or worse? Um, the COVID-19 has done, I, I think it's, I have two answers to that. Uh, 2020 was supposed to be the super year for nature. Uh, it, we were supposed to have this uh, global framework for biodiversity, the post-2020 global framework for biodiversity adopted by countries in Kunming, China. That did not happen because the pandemic brought a lockdown. So the, that has been postponed. So we do not have a new guideline on, on this. Hopefully we'll do it in 2020. 2020, um, 2021, 2020 was also supposed to be the year for climate change. Uh, where countries were supposed to revise their NDC. So last year was really aimed to be a, a super year for nature. Uh, unfortunately, none of the things happened. But I believe we still had our super year because it brought the issues of biodiversity to the front. Most people did not make those linkages between um, humans encroaching to moving too close to wild uh, spaces and wild animals. And also the, the challenges brought by the illegal, not the legal channel, the illegal wildlife trade, because part of this illegality is what triggers zoonotic diseases. As you may know, in addition to COVID-19, we have the Ebola, which is also a zoonotic disease coming from um, bats and apes, etc., in the Congo forest. So the long answer is, or the short answer is yes, there has been some positive things coming out uh, from COVID-19, uh, especially highlighting biodiversity. Um, 
on the negative side, we have lost resources which go to conserving biodiversity. With the lockdown, tourists are not able to visit some of the protected areas, uh, especially in Africa, which depend almost 100% on resources from tourism. The eco-based tourism went down. So the communities around these areas may end up going back to the illegal practices like poaching and um, illegally harvesting some of these resources because they are living next to nature and without any incomes for almost a year. It's been tough. Okay, I will try and summarize that question. Um, I think Leif is asking how to balance the hunting needs and the biodiversity, and how do you manage to ensure that the two are balanced uh, in a positive way for nature and people. Um, there are many guidelines out there. Some work, some don't work, because um, we are humans, so we may just when you get a permit, I'll just give a local example. If you get a permit to go and hunt moose in October or September, whenever the season opens, you may not necessarily shoot what you're allowed to. Maybe it's accidental or not. Um, but we believe that there are other ways of controlling this wildlife. If, if the main reason we are, we are um, hunting this wildlife is to control the population. I think there are m other ways that these wildlife populations can be maintained. Maybe allowing some years to go by without really hunting. Um, maybe make the permits more expensive so it's fewer, <laughs> fewer shootings going on of the hunting. But um, I will give an example from Africa because this is where I work. Um, sometimes the tourists will come in, or a hunter, and pay X amount of money to go and shoot some lions and some elephants. And of course, ethically, there are all these ethical questions of is it good, is it not good, depending on how it's done. If it's uh, an animal which has been just brought up to be hunted, they have been captive captive breeding, etc. And then the funds, whatever is paid, the, the hunter feels really good that they have done their part, they have paid for the permit, etc. But then much of those resources don't end up going back to the wild and conserving the wild animal. So it ends up at the wrong... You end up promoting the wrong business, let's call it that. So in that case, it's, um, it's good to weigh your options to see how best to not participate in some of these unethical hunting practices which are there, because there are many. But of course, as a, as a paying client, no one will tell you that, the, by the way, the animal you're, you're hunting right now is not a, has been brought up in a, in a farm and is actually starving. That's the reason it's coming towards you. So yeah, it's actually, you're not doing a proper hunt sometimes. Uh, but also, I, I, from a personal perspective, I feel there are better ways of managing wildlife more than hunting. Uh, yeah, but if it's for food, you know that's another issue. You cannot stop communities uh, from hunting for sustenance, especially if the, the animals are living around them. Um, we also have to look at the numbers. If we feel there are plenty, then of course, go ahead and 
issue as many permits as possible and if the population is increasing and growing in a good number then that is welcome but we can tell sometimes that the populations are not healthy and yet hunting is going on yeah but also the the irony of everything is um sometimes we have we have countries being told, okay, protect your elephants, protect, you. and these are really dangerous animals, uh, lions and elephants cro crossing into, into farms and eating livestock and cheetah and everything. And um, those promoting these pr kind of practices, when you go back to their countries, they have finished all their wolves and, and um, the reindeers, I don't know, the mooses. So you, you look at the at the being told not to hunt or not to control your elephant populations on one hand and on the other hand people are controlling moose and reindeer you know animals really which do not kill people maybe they cause a few traffic accidents but they are not it's not a lion sitting in your backyard yet at least from the african side we are trying really hard to live with these animals despite uh, all the challenges we have so if we can do that, I think other countries can manage their wildlife populations in a similar way. Otherwise, it's very, I find it very strange sometimes, yeah, that the, we advocate for two things which are completely different, yeah. Okay, we have a few questions here. Um, one is coming from Ingvar Lukunodin. He asks, what would be a good strategy to counteract Homo sapiens' tendency to place itself outside of nature, which, in my view, lies at the bottom of the anthropocentric that leads the wrong way, anthropocentricity that leads the wrong way? I Do miss you want me to repeat that? Yes, please. What would be a good strategy to counteract Homo sapiens' tendency to place itself outside of nature, which, in my view, lies at the bottom of the anthropocentricity that leads the wrong way? How do we address the Homo sapiens' nature <laughs> of placing tens tendencies of nature. keeping themselves outside nature? I think we are part of nature, and the more we, are, we realize that, the quicker we realize that, the better it will be for our planet. We cannot be outside nature, uh, because we, we depend on nature for our own existence. Uh, and not just, yeah, like I said, the air we breathe is being purified, and the water we are drinking is being purified by some of the forests we have here. You can see areas which have no trees, have no water. For, for, you, for Sweden, it's different. You have lots of water. But in Africa, some areas have literally gone dry because we don't have enough water, etc., from deforestation. Uh, and that is our biggest challenge, actually, deforestation. Uh, but I think we just have to go through the advocacy channel and encourage more people to visit and be out there in nature so they learn and get the benefits from it. Uh, we cannot change mindsets uh, for old people right now, but we can't change the younger ones because they are the new generation. They are, they are barely out in nature, but they are the ones we should work on. Um, I think it's, a more, it's more of a moral issue and more... Maybe now we are starting to realize that when we do one thing in nature, it can fight back, and then you know you're, you're part of nature. I think we had for many years forgotten about the environment and the role it plays in our lives. And probably that's why we are in a pandemic right now. We had to take a break and slow down a little bit and think about how we need to move forward uh, in this globalization and trying to develop as fast as possible and detach as much as possible from nature. But I think this time with the pandemic, people have been more at home and connecting more with nature, those are, that have been able to. But we are part of a system and we are all part of nature. Uh, 
a lot of comments here, but there are no really questions. Uh, well, they say, well done, and things like that. So any more questions from the audience here? I have a thought. Yes, <laughs> please, go on. You mentioned that, or the person have mentioned that uh, humans are not connected to nature anymore, or at least a lot of people are not connected to nature. How do you think in those perspectives, biodiversity, hunting and so on, how could we get people to get more connected to nature? I have one answer. And that's learn tracking. That's a good thing, I think. But how do you see on that? How do we get? I'll just repeat because for the those who are not able to hear. Yeah, okay. uh, so how do we better connect to nature yeah. through biodiversity? And you proposed one solution. One solution is learn how to track the animals. How to track the animals. Yeah. Tracking by putting the tracks or to no, follow? Follow, follow, them tracks. follow the tracks. Yeah. I think, to be honest and to be fair, I think hunters are more connected to nature than many other people because they learn about the, the animals, they learn how they move, they follow, the, they follow their paths, they kind of study these animals and a good number of them, at least those, they would know how to ensure that the species survives. Of course, not everyone has that principle, and that's where, the, as I said, the hunting goes wrong. So of course, activities that you could introduce to young children, and the, because those are the ones we are target the youth, because those are the ones you can change their perspectives uh, easier, is to, of course, encourage them to go out and see some of these animals, see where they live, monitor the populations if they can, be involved in the tracking, as you're saying, and this, of course, will make them better managers of the environment and ensuring that this species is there because um, the whole concept about sustainability is ensuring that you use what you can now but ensure that there is something left for future generations. So it's a development concept for making sure that your children, student children also get to see the moose with the bigger horns, something like that. So I think your proposal, Mr. Leif, is quite good. Uh, tracking, working with animals could be one way to connect to nature uh, as opposed to watching them on Nat Geo. Mm -hmm. Any more reflections? <laughs> No more questions here, so... So, thank you, Mugens. Thank you so much. This is for, this is for a gift from a fair trade shop. So, thank, thank you. you so much. If I just could say a few words. So thank you, Leah. Um, I'm just going to finish this in Swedish because the two, the two uh, lectures later on this week are going to be in Swedish. Och det är på torsdag. Då kommer har vi en föreläsning som heter. Modern skogsbruk och biologisk mångfald är en omöjlighet. Eh, och på fredag har vi en föreläsning som heter Det öppna landskapets mångfald, då, nu och i morgon. Det första är det med Svea Skog och det andra är det med Naturskyddsföreningen. Båda två kan ses via länk, men det är även möjligt att vara på plats här på Folkets i Gånersbyn. Eh, och vi tar in åtta pers personer i publiken. 
Det var allt för denna gång från Miljöveckan i Gornarsbyn. Ha en bra kväll. Tack för idag. Thank <laughs> you.